I'm going to talk a little bit about the die fading kinetic experiment, in particular, how to obtain kinetic parameters from dynamic data. So let me give you a little bit of background on this uh, on this experiment. Is phenolphthalein uh, is desired to be used to find the residence time of an industrial CSTR, but in order to do that, we have to find the order of the reactions, uh, the Arrhenius constants, activation energy, heat of reaction, and uh, equilibrium constants. And you have two, uh, two reactions when you add phenolphthalein to a hydroxide solution. You have phenolphthalein plus a hydroxide goes to pH 2 minus. That's very fast and irreversible reaction. The other reaction that uh, we're going to be using for this study is the pH 2 minus plus a hydroxide going to this uh, pH OH 3 minus, which is a very slow reaction. It's also reversible, so it can go back. Uh, the other way as well. Here's the experimental apparatus you have uh, with this uh, reactor. It's a little benchtop uh, experiment in the unit operations lab and you have a thermal couple which uh, records the temperature and then also a spectrophotometer probe that measures the absorbance of the uh, of, of light and uh, is going to be used to correlate to a concentration of one of our species that is uh, colored, um, a colored con uh, species. And uh, then you also have the water bath inlet and outlet that is used for temperature control. So if you want to change the temperature of your bath, you can uh, also dial in that set point and it will seek to um, either cool or heat the uh, reactor to attain a different temperature. And you also have a stir to make maintain the uh, reactor with, with uh, a constant concentration throughout the reactor. Okay, and then the waste drain is just to drain uh, once you're done with the reaction. Okay, so we're going to talk about isothermal runs uh, where the uh, the reaction is maintained at a constant temperature throughout the run and then also how to use dynamic uh, runs, so using dynamic uh, data to fit parameters and in, in particular we need to change the temperature uh, throughout the run. So we'll talk about talk about both of those. This is just a little bit of background on uh, the reaction. The phenolphthalein, as I mentioned, that goes to the pH 2 minus in an irreversible manner very fast. And then the second reaction was the one listed uh, above here where you have the, the phenolphthalein 2 minus plus a hydroxide and again it's a reversible reaction to this pH OH 3 minus. And if you just look at the, if you just write the reaction rate for this we have our uh, rate of reaction, the rate of, of disappearance of this pH 2 minus is going to be equal to the forward rate minus uh, the reverse rate. Now OH minus is going to be uh, in, in a much higher concentration than the pH uh, 2 minus or the minus 2 and, and so this can be assumed to be constant so it can be lumped into this this K1. So really you just have a forward reaction that's K1, or you can say K1 prime times pH uh, 2 minus minus K2 pH OH uh, minus 3, or 3 minus. Okay, so we're going to use the Beer-Lambert's law to relate the absorbance of light to the properties of the material through which the light is traveling. And so we can, we can measure absorbance and base our kinetic model off of this absorbance without worrying about uh, getting it back to concentration. And so here is the uh, pH uh, 2 minus um, in the lactone form. And then the, here is the uh, pH OH 3 minus, which is colorless. So we're going to be measuring the absorbance of this uh, lactone form, uh, which is red, and uh, correlating that to concentrations for a reaction. Okay, so this is the traditional approach that uh, was taught in kinetics class, and many of you are familiar with this approach. This, um, in this approach, we take the Arrhenius expression to find Ea and A, the, the pre-exponential factor. And what we do is take, uh, many of you have seen the Arrhenius expression in this form. Well, if we just take the natural log of both sides and rearrange it slightly, this looks like uh, the equation for a line, where we can plot natural log of K, and that is on the y-axis, and then we plot 1 over temperature on the x-axis and then this becomes our slope and this becomes our intercept. 
So if we have isothermal runs, we can do a run and uh, plot the temperature at which that was run, or the inverse of that temperature, by the uh, natural log of the uh, kinetic parameter. And then once we plot that, the slope is equal to negative EA over R. And then the intercept is equal to natural log of A. So that's, that's a way that researchers have found kinetic data in the past. And the issue with this approach is that every data point that you see on here, um, that is from one isothermal run. And each of those data points can take between one hour and, uh, and 10 hours to run. So here you're, you're looking at data that uh, is, has taken a long time to collect and uh, maintain constant temperature in the reactor. I'm going to be talking about a different way of finding our kinetic parameters, a way that can potentially allow you to, to do this data collection on just one hour's worth of data and be able to obtain better kinetic parameters than you can by using this traditional approach. And then also uh, from the traditional approach as well, you have uh, you can also plot uh, the ratio of equilibrium constants to the uh, difference in temperatures and find your uh, heat of reaction. Um, an another way to do that is just take the activation energy of the forward reaction minus the activation energy of the reverse reaction and that can also give you the, the heat of reaction. Okay, so I want to talk about how to just generate a dynamic model first. So I'm going to escape from this. I'm going to go ahead and start creating this model. I just created a new folder on my desktop and I'm going to call this uh, simulate. Okay, once I uh, open up that folder, then I'm going to um, go ahead and create a new uh, text file. And this one, I'm going to rename it to die.apm. That's going to be my model file. APM is just the extension for the AP Monitor modeling language. It's just a text file. It can be edited by any text editor. The text editor I'm going to use is uh, called EditPad. Uh, but Notepad or others can be used. I like to use um, as well the Notepad++. It's a good free editor that extends beyond uh, what Notepad for Windows can provide. So what I'm going to do first of all is I'm going to go ahead and create uh, just my basic model, which is model and model. And then within that model, I'm going to have a number of different things. I'm going to have, first of all, um, a constant uh, section and then end constants and then within that section I just have one constant in this case that's going to be my uh, universal gas constant um, that uh, I've defined there as joules per mole Kelvin. I can put a comment character in there um, if I want joules per mole Kelvin uh, it can be an exclamation mark or a uh, percent sign or others or comment characters. Okay, so once I've defined a constant, now I have some uh, kinetic parameters that I want to define as well. So let me go ahead and make a parameter section with end uh, parameters. Okay, now in that parameter section, I'm going to have a couple activation energies. Let's do the activation energy for the forward reaction. I'm just going to use some approximate literature values there. Uh, EA1 of uh, 36,000 and this one is going to be uh, joules per mole and then EA2 is going to be 77,000 that's the reverse reaction okay so a little higher activation energy on the reverse and then I have a pre-exponential factor A1 this is in the forward um, the forward direction Five five six five five zero. Um, that's a just an approximate ledger value, and that is um, that is going to be in the one over minute um, units. Okay, then A two is is actually one point four four e to the eleventh uh, times ten to the eleventh, and that's also going to be one over uh, minutes as well. And then I have an alpha, that's the um, exponent on the uh, pH 2 minus. And I'm just going to put that at, at 1. Just assume it's first order uh, reaction. And then beta 
I'll say that's one. That's the exponent on the on the pH OH three minus, or the reverse uh, reaction. Okay, and then I also have temperature as well. Temperature, I'm just going to put that at 300. Uh, I'll put this in Kelvin um, for the temperature. You're probably going to measure it in Fahrenheit, so you might need to convert that over. And then I have variables, and then end variables. And so I'm going to have two variables in this case, just the pH 2 minus. Uh, I'll just name that as pH. And I'll start that, initial, give it an initial condition of 1.0, and then the pH OH, and I'll give that initial condition of 0. Okay, now I have um, some equations that I want to write as well. It actually, it's just one, uh, two equations. So uh, these are going to be uh, species balances on just for the reaction rate on uh, pH and then pH OH. Uh, okay, so I have pH, and that's going to be uh, the uh, that's going to be the the forward uh, reaction rate, reaction one minus uh, reaction two. Okay, actually that that's, that's going to be um, negative on the forward and then positive on the uh, reverse reaction rate. So as the forward reaction rate occurs, it's going to make this uh, go negative. The derivative, this is a time derivative, d pH dt. Um, so as, as the forward reaction happens, uh, this is going to be negative and it's going to decrease the concentration of pH. Okay, so let's go ahead and write one for p, uh, pH OH um, as well. Okay, so that's going to be um, reaction 1 minus reaction 2. Okay, just the opposite of pH. Okay, now I have reaction 1 and reaction 2 defined. Let me create an intermediate um, just to make the equations a bit simpler. Uh, I can either put all of the kinetic parameters here uh, to describe reaction 1 and reaction 2, but since I'm using reaction 1 twice and also reaction 2 twice, I'm going to create an intermediate variable so that I can use those in my equation section. So first of all, I'm going to write K1. Uh, that's going to be A1. This is the Arrhenius expression. And minus EA1 divided by R times temperature. Okay, temperature in Kelvin. And then I have uh, the, the, uh, the kinetic rate constant K2, which is going to be A2 times EXP negative EA2 divided by R times T. Okay, so I have my, um, I have my two uh, kinetic rate constants there, and now I just need to uh, define my reaction rates. So reaction rate of one is going to be K1 times uh, pH to the alpha, and then reaction two is going to be K2 times uh, pH OH, to the gamma. And okay, so now we have our model here. Uh, now what we want to do is uh, go ahead and close this, close the model, and uh, and then we want to create a new file. Uh, we'll just call this die.csv. This is going to be a comma separated value. So this is where we're going to put some data. And what I'm going to do is go ahead and open this up with Excel. Okay, now that uh, Excel is open. I'm going to create uh, just a single uh, column here, one for time, and then I'm also going to put in temperature as well, so we can play around with the uh, the temperature values and see how they uh, see how this simulates with the change in in temperature. Okay, so I'm going to put in time zero one, um, you know, just one minute intervals here. I want to simulate that out to about uh, an hour. Okay, so we just want to see what this is going to simulate to over the course of an hour. I'm just going to start at 300 Kelvin, and then every minute it's going to increase by one degree. Uh, if I just click on that, that black box there, it fills down. Okay, so increase by one degree every minute, so it gets up to 360 degrees Kelvin after an hour. Okay, and then I go ahead and save it. It's going to ask me this question. It says, uh, you know, may contain features that are not in compatible with text, tab delimited. Do you want to keep the workbook uh, in this format? And actually we don't. We want to 
um, save it as a comma separated okay so let's go ahead and do MS-DOS uh, version of the uh, comma delimited actually here it is comma delimited um, CSV file and it says it already exists you want to replace it I'll click yes and then again it uh, says uh, th this message go ahead and click yes here um, and it will save it and then you can go ahead and close it um, and don't save if I open this up um, if I open it up with notepad I can see that my CSV file just consists of time and temperature and then the values I entered in uh, delimited by a comma okay so that's exactly what we need we have now a data file an APM file and then a uh, or sorry a, a model file APM and then our data file CSV so we need one other thing to uh, simulate this uh, simulate this model with the data that we have and what we need to do is is go to the AP monitor uh, APMonitor.com and then if you scroll down you can get down to the APM MATLAB interface go ahead and download uh, the latest files that are there and that will download it to your computer as a zipped archive you just go ahead and click on this and open it up it will also have an APM uh, folder in there along with a number of example applications the only thing that we need is the APM folder so I'm just going to go ahead and select that and copy it okay so let me go ahead and copy that and then I'm going to come back to my simulate folder and then I'm going to paste that in here okay so this is just a collection of a number of libraries and other functionality necessary to be able to simulate this in MATLAB okay so I have my model file my data file and then my APM model libraries now what I'm going to do is go ahead and create a new text document. This is going to be main. I'm going to shift that to main.m. This is going to be a MATLAB script function. And if I double click on that, it's going to open up MATLAB for me. So we're going to simulate this in, in MATLAB. Okay, and the, and the first thing I'm going to do in MATLAB is go ahead and just clear everything uh, that may be there from a uh, previous session. So CLC that clears the screen, clear all, clears all the variables, and then close all closes all the plots. And I can also put a comment character in here. Uh, that's just the percent sign. Uh, clear everything. Okay, now that I've cleared everything, I also want to load um, the APM libraries, and I'll do that with an add path uh, just to the APM folder so it knows where to look to go for some of those function calls and then the one function call that we will load in now is um, this is going to be the uh, uh, sol to solve the model so I'm going to put the results into Y and then I'm going to use the APM solve command and I named my model and data file die okay so it's going to solve this and then it's going to return the results into the Y value here okay so now I'm gonna go ahead and run this um, let's see I had a, a problem at line 5 so if I double click that I go back to add path I think I just um, put an underscore there where there shouldn't have been but you can go debug it as well uh, if it returns an error and then just click on it it'll bring you right to where uh, the problem is okay so I'm gonna go ahead and rerun it again okay and then I see that there is a problem here. Um, it said there's an error in the syntax of a function string with uh, gamma. So let's go take a look at uh, our model file. Okay, so I'm going to close this out and I'm going to open up my folder again that I had with the, uh, the simulate. Okay, and actually let me just minimize this minimize that and so I'm going to open up my model file again so I had a problem with uh, gamma and and uh, there it is I had I just named one of them beta and then here it was gamma so what I need to do it then is just go ahead and rename this as beta I had alpha and beta as the exponential factors okay so just a little bit of troubleshooting there both with MATLAB and also with APM and some of the messages that it returns Okay, so now uh, I went ahead and ran it again. I clicked the Run button up here. 
Uh, and you can either run it in uh, debug mode if you want to put in, uh, for example, a break with F12. It'll stop there and then you can enter in and, and go into debug mode or you can just run it uh, directly. So I, I ran it. Let me get back to my MATLAB uh, command prompt here. Um, so here's the result of Y. I have the names, y.names, those are all the names of all my variables. I have y.values, okay, those are all the values, a huge matrix of, of values. And the one that's going to be most interesting to us is y.x. So y.x.time are going to be all the times that I had. That's 1 through uh, 0 through 60. And in fact, now I want to generate a figure. I'll just create a new figure. Uh, here, I, I brought up the figure. It's a blank figure. And then what I'll do is uh, go ahead and plot. Uh, let me just plot my y.x.time uh, with y.x.ph. Uh, okay, and then I'll go back to my plot. And there I can see my simulated phenolphthalein concentration over time. Okay, so those are the, some of the results. If I, if I want to save this um, out of uh, you know, MATLAB into a text file, I can just do save uh, dash ASCII, and then I'll do results.txt, um, and I'll save y.x.ph. Okay, that's uh, y. It's not a valid variable name. Okay, let me. Let me actually generate it into a, a data uh, structure. So y.x.time, y.x.ph. Okay, so there I have data, and then I just want to save that um, as an ASCII file, a text file, into results.txt, and then I'll save the data uh, there. So I can also type edit uh, results txt and this will just bring up the text uh, editor in MATLAB and there I can see the results with the times and the phenolphthalein concentrations. Okay now that we've simulated the dynamics um, the dynamics we have uh, you know, I generated another plot here that uh, adds some legends and, and Y labels and X labels as well uh, just to be able to view the, the results. So the thing that we're going to be doing is um, we have a model now that will simulate starting from initial conditions. I just di dialed in 1.0 for the initial conditions of the uh, the absorbance here for the phenolphthalein. And then these would be, you know, for example, if you had measured uh, the value at every minute, this is what the model is predicting over that hour. And then this is with the temperature that's ramped from 300 to 360 uh, degrees Kelvin. Okay, so this is actually some some uh, data uh, that shows uh, you know a constant temperature run. Uh, this is the at 60 degrees Fahrenheit with the absorbance. You can see the the noise in the data. You can have uh, you know noise here. You have a period of a little bit more noise. Uh, you know, didn't know why that had increased during that time, but maybe something with the the spectrophotometer. Um, and then it, it leveled out to a steady state. Okay, now you can see the time here. This is over 10 hours uh, at 60 degrees, which is a very is the lowest temperature that we're going to be uh, running. But it took a very very long time to come to steady state, and, and this is what was needed uh, in order to be able to uh, add just one data point uh, to that plot from the traditional method. So we're going to show another way on how to do this with dynamic data. Uh, you know, I, as I mentioned before, you had uh, 60 degrees Fahrenheit very slow. If you get up to 110 degrees Fahrenheit, it's very fast uh, to get to steady state. But each one of these is just one data point uh, for the analysis. But if you uh, you know increase the temperature or decrease the temperature throughout the run, so here's the temperature. It started high at uh, about 111, and then went down to 60, and then here's another one where it started at 60 and it went up to about 150 degrees Fahrenheit. And you can actually see this, uh, you know, it started low to low temperature. So this would have been like the 10 hour run. But as you increase the temperature, it starts to accelerate the reaction. It gets down to almost a steady state value. And then you can see the equilibrium values shift uh, back up. Now as you 
uh, as you increase the temperature, it thermodynamically uh, favors the uh, red dye, so it becomes a little bit more concentrated in the red as the uh, you know the reverse reaction as you increase the temperature. Okay, so no clear equilibrium. We can't use the former methods that, that we used uh, to analyze this. Uh, we're going to take that same model now and fit our model to the data. So here you can see uh, you know, the data, the absorbance data. And what we want to do is fit our model, the blue line, uh, to, this, uh, to the orange. Um, and, and then we also have, gave it a little bit of a dead band there just to account for the noise so that we're not fitting the, the noise in the data. But we're just trying to fit the, the general trend. In this case, a solver required about 34 uh, iterations. Uh, we, we did put some bounds on the activation energy and the uh, and and the exponents uh, for the order of the reaction, just to give a feasible, um, realistic solution. And the solution took time took about uh, was less than one second. Okay, so after you have run the experiment uh, with the non-isothermal uh, data, you one of the things you'll have to do with that is record the temperature. Uh, at the same frequency at which you uh, want to be able to also record the the uh, reaction rate or the uh, absorbance of phenolphthalein and that is not done automatically so you'll actually have to just record the temperature throughout the run manually and then sync that back up with um, <clears throat> the data that you obtain from the spectrophotometer. What I have here is just some uh, a fake data set I'm going to go ahead and open that up in Excel. So if I had time, this would be in minutes, and then the temperature, this is in Kelvin, and this might be the absorbance, uh, for example. Again, this is this is just fake data uh, with some noise uh, that I've added. And uh, what I'm going to do now is um, take my fake data, uh, save that as a CSV file. Again, that's a comma separated, uh, comma separated value. And uh, let me go ahead and open that up. Again, it's just time, temperature, and phenolphthalein concentration, just separated by commas, and you can export that from Excel. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and replace what was there, the die.csv, and just go ahead and rename this uh, die fake data as die.csv for my data file. And then I also have my model file that uh, we constructed previously. Okay, say so model. And uh, then what I'm going to do is, is go ahead and open up this main.m script. This one's a little bit longer, and I, I don't necessarily want to go through all of the aspects of this, but it's, it's very similar to the previous one. Just a little bit more configuration. Now that we're not just uh, dynamically simulating the model, we're actually trying to estimate some of these parameters. I'm going to load, um, I'm going to go ahead and load my libraries, clear everything out. Uh, go ahead and select the server. You can also use the byu.apmonitor.com server. Just go ahead and uncomment one or select the other. Um, and I'm going to name my application. I'm going to clear everything off of the server with that application name. Load my model. Load the uh, CSV file. And then I'm going to specify the parameters that I want to estimate. Okay, so I have my activation energy, my pre-exponential factors, my alpha, and my gamma or beta um, as the other model was. And then I have my temperature, um, and then I, a state variable is one that's not measured, but we want to be able to look at it through the, the web interface. And then here's the one that's measured, which is the uh, pH or phenolphthalein uh, concentration given by the absorbance of the red dye. Okay, now here's some options. Um, these are just options to set up the estimation. I, I set it to dynamic estimation. I selected the solver, the APOP solver. Uh, these two are just, the F status is just to say feedback status of pH, uh, set that on. Uh, turn on the status for all of these uh, parameters. That just means estimate those parameters. And I set a max iteration for my solver of 200 iterations. And then I set my EV type, that's my estimated variable type, to a, an L1 norm or an, kind of like an absolute value uh, formulation. So even if there are outliers, it doesn't try to fit the outliers. Okay, and then I also gave it a, a measurement gap. So this is, you know, to account for the noise, we don't want to fit the noise. So I gave it a little bit of a gap there so that uh, it doesn't adjust the parameters of the model unless the measurements are outside of that gap away from uh, the measured value. And then I say solve. Okay, so this is going to solve uh, solve the model. And then I want to return the solution. 
and then open up the web viewer. So I'm going to go ahead and run this. Um, and this one, I'm going to click Change Folder. Uh, I'm not currently in that folder, uh, but I'm going to go ahead and click Change, and that'll run it uh, from that folder, uh, accessing all the files. Okay, so now it uh, returned the solution. And what I'm going to do is go ahead and look at the temperature, for example. Here's the temperature that we had uh, recorded over the run. Uh, if I scroll down a little bit, I'll see the pHOH. Okay, so there's the concentration uh, that's predicted. We didn't have any measurements for this, but of the pHOH3 uh, minus. And then I also have it of the uh, pH. So I'm going to create this one. I'm going to go to full screen on this, just clicking on the plot. And then I can see that uh, you know here is my model prediction in blue, and then these were you know just fake data that I put in there, uh, and you can see that it, it fits uh, reasonably well. If I want to get my parameter values now, they're just uh, they are. If I go over to FVs, uh, it will show all of my parameter values in the new val section right there. Those are the estimated parameters. Here's what I started with on those parameter values. Okay, so those were the last values, and then these are the new values right here. Okay, so that um, that concludes uh, the demonstration of how we estimate uh, these parameters from dynamic data. Uh, this is uh, something that can potentially save you a lot of time in the lab. The, uh, if you do it with the isothermal run, some of those take up to 10 hours each to run. Uh, doing a dynamic data run takes about an hour, and you can obtain all of your kinetic parameters from that one hour's worth of uh, data collection. Uh, you just have to be able to have the, the right tools to be able to do that. Um, you know, you can, uh, there, there's some online documentation if you're confused about how to uh, use AP Monitor. If you just go to apmonitor.com, and then select documentation. Uh, this has uh, a number of documentation topics uh, with some example applications from a number, number of different areas um, and uh, documentation on how to use um, steady state dynamic um, <coughs> modes of simulation. Okay, so um, that concludes the, the demonstration. Uh, you know, if you have any questions about this, um, feel free to come and, and talk to me later.